So there's a common thread in our encounter with God. We're feeling that even right now. I mean, this is God's presence just here in this place. And there's, there's a common thread in encountering God. Not just something that we sort of contrive, but like if you just read the history of the people who have encountered God, there's always a thread. And the thread has three major movements in it. The first one is that when people encounter God, they're stunned. That's where we started last night. Not just impressed, stunned, stopped, dead in their tracks, quieted, shut down, bowed down, amazed, speechless, in awe, stunned. We need this in our church. To shift from consumerism to that costly kind of fellowship, you have to be stunned. Not that it really matters, it's a, it's a, a, a trivial thing really, but, but so much so that you, you might even put your latte down. Like that stunned. Like I'm in the presence of the living God. I, I don't care if my phone goes off in my pocket or not, whatever it is, it can wait. I have my eyes open and I'm stunned by the majesty of God. Have you ever been stunned by an encounter with God? Because it's likely that a bunch of us maybe haven't gotten there fully yet. It's not automatic. It is a gift of God. Have your eyes open and to be stunned by God. We saw that in Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted and the train of, train of his robe fill the temple and I'd never seen anything like that before. <laughs> the second thing that happens in this journey of encountering God is that we're seared. And that's what Isaiah said. You know, we, we kind of ended in that place last night, but that's what happened to Isaiah when he said, I'm, I'm in trouble here. It says in verse six, then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. So there was this burning altar in the presence of God long before there was any sacrifice in the Old Testament days. This is pre, you know, pre-world presence of God. There's an altar there. there there's a there's a presence there, there's a, there's a fire there, and in, in this fire, this seraph takes a coal in these tongs, and, and he sees Isaiah in his stunned condition saying, uh-oh, I'm in really big trouble here, and he flies with this, this, the, this coal in these tongs towards Isaiah. The, you know, I always stop on this verse, because can you imagine, you, you, if you're Isaiah, you're thinking, he's coming to finish me with that fiery thing that he's flying through the air with. Because Isaiah isn't thinking salvation. He isn't thinking mercy and kindness. He's thinking, woe is me, I am done. And what I love about it is when he had this encounter, when he was stunned by God, he not only was reframed about his own condition, he really understood who he was. He was really broken up about the condition of the people around him. And that's when you know that you've had an encounter with God. When you start weeping over your own sin, you know you're getting close. But when you start weeping over the sin of your roommates and your dorm mates and your sweet mates, then you know you have seen God. You have seen the Lord. Because you start saying, God, please have mercy on them. They don't know what they're doing. They're crazy. They're foolish. They haven't seen what I have seen. They haven't tasted what I've tasted. They don't know there's something better. They don't know there's another way. They don't know there's something more. They don't know how much you care about them. They don't know about mercy that heals and grace that restores. They don't know any of that. So they're just doing dumb stuff. They're just living blind right now. They're foolish right now. But I'm praying, God, that you'll have mercy on them. And I'm asking you to have kindness and favor on them. When you start hearing prayers on your campus like that, give me a ring because somebody saw Jesus. 
and the seeds of awakening are in the ground. Because it's more than just the people who already got it, you know, coming to sing the songs one more time. It's people saying, I got it, but not only did I get my heart blown apart about my own condition, do you understand that without a, a vision of God, we, we don't really have a chance to really get the gospel. I'll never get the gospel without being stunned by who God is. You, you, the gospel will be pretty good news to you and to me unless we have seen God. And when you see him, the gospel becomes life and breath to you. It becomes the news in your life. And so here he comes with this coal. Imagine that, and Isaiah isn't thinking, oh, this is gonna be fantastic, I'm about to get redeemed. He's thinking, I'm done, and this seraph knows I'm done, and he's flying now from the holy altar of God with something flaming, it looks like, in tongs, and he's coming right for me with it. Oh, no, this is it. That's right where you are when, when you fall into the ocean of grace. And the seraph's not coming to finish him off, he's coming to bring him to life. And the very flame that he thinks is gonna destroy him is the flame that's gonna refine all of the wrong out of him and bring him into a right relationship with God. And that's kind of the way it is with the cross. When we first get a glimpse of the cross, we kind of start feeling like, oh no, maybe I'm the one that's gonna be finished here. And then we see, no, as the cross gets closer and closer, it's not the wrath of God that's gonna hit us, it's the wrath of God that's gonna hit Christ and mercy is gonna come to our lives. And so the coal comes and, and he says, and this is what happened, the, the coal comes, he comes flying with these tongs and this coal and he touched my mouth and he said to me, see, there's the word, see. That he said, do, do you see Isaiah? Look, open your eyes to this, see. This has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away. Can you just say that phrase with me? Your guilt is taken away. Can we say my guilt, put it personal? My guilt is taken away. Can you say that like you believe that? My guilt is taken away. This is a rocket shot into the gates of hell. Because for whatever reason, that the number one working plan of the enemy is to convince us that we're still clamped down in the guilt over all the stuff we've messed up in our lives. And somehow it works time after time after time. And we get into worship, into the family, into community, into the word, into a walk with Jesus. But the enemy keeps coming along and saying, hey, don't get too crazy on me now because remember what you did, where you were, who you were, and what went down. Let's don't get too crazy in following Jesus because of all of the stuff of the past and he just hangs the shame on us. And we have let him do that in our lives for so long. We've just agreed with him and said, you know what, you're probably right, I, I really was a, a colossal screw up. And there is a lot of collateral and you're, you're probably right. Instead of saying to him, I, I agree with God. And when grace came to me, I thought God might just obliterate me, but instead he obliterated Jesus. And when he obliterated Jesus, somehow the flaming coal of his forgiveness touched my life. And guess what? My guilt is taken away. My guilt is taken away. So, so go find somebody else who wants to buy into that story because I won't buy into that story. It's like Judah was saying this afternoon. You just have to talk back sometimes to the enemy. You have to know that you have a voice and you can use your voice. Not to come up with your own argument because that's not going to work, but just agree with God and say to him like Judah said, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Or say to him, hey, at the cross, my guilt was taken away. So you're gonna go down the hall to somebody who doesn't know anything about the gospel because I am living in the power of what Jesus has done in my life. I didn't deserve it, I didn't earn it, I didn't achieve it, but God brought it to my life and my guilt is taken away. That could become our daily prayer. Thank you, God, that my guilt is taken away. I agree with you. 
and I will not sit in shame. I'll not sit in the past. I'm not gonna sit in my brokenness. I'm not gonna sit in my rebellion. I'm not gonna feel like I'm never gonna be used by you because my guilt is taken away. Anybody have anything here you need it taken away? Are we all, we all good? Did anybody have anything here you need it taken away? Anybody here have anything you needed taken away? I'm not talking about a little unspoken, you know, that you're gonna pass in there at the last minute. I mean, some big, gigantic breach of the goodness of God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We got any large scale mess ups here? And has anybody heard the enemy lately trying to remind you of that? Video evidence. Do you know that your guilt is taken away? Do you know that? Do we know that? The seraph had a word. He said, hey, see this? Do you see this? What was this? What was this coal? This coal was the grace of God in Christ Jesus, even though it was Isaiah 6. Isaiah is already talking about Jesus. And he's saying this flaming coal is the grace of God in Christ Jesus, and it's coming from the holy altar of God all the way down to where you're in a mess. So you're not coming up to the holy altar of God. The holy altar of God's coming down to where you are, and I'm sending grace down to touch your mouth, to touch your hands, to touch your body, to touch your heart, to touch your soul, to touch your mind and your insides. I wanna touch every part of you that says, that you say about that part, woe is me. I wanna touch that and I wanna take your guilt away. And here's how I'm gonna do that. He said, the way I'm gonna take your guilt away is by this next little phrase. Your guilt is taken away and, there's more, your sin atoned for. Now this is getting back to what Francis was saying and what God's really been saying since we showed up at the Toyota Center. It's not just God showing up and saying, hey, I'm gonna take your guilt away. Isn't that awesome? He's saying, I am gonna take your guilt away, but the way I'm going to take your guilt away is by atoning for your guilt. Because I'm a holy, righteous, just God and a loving, merciful, and forgiving God. I am both God's like that in one God. I have mercy, but I also have wrath. I have kindness, but I also have righteousness. I, I have a sense of grace in my heart and love in my heart, but I am also holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, and I cannot divide myself. And so I want to take your guilt away, but the only way to take your guilt away is to atone for it. And so Isaiah, centuries before Jesus, gets a message from a flying, six-winged creature of God. And he tells him the same thing he's telling us. We just know a lot more about it than Isaiah did. He said, your guilt's taken away. How? Your sin's atoned for. And so whenever I allow the enemy to, to put guilt on me, I basically just undercut the work of Jesus. And he says it's finished, and I say, no, it's not. He said, it is finished, and I say, well, it's not completely finished, because I'm gonna have to carry it a little bit longer. He says, it is finished, and we say, well, for most people, true, but for me, I'm gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to sit with this a while. And he's saying, no, your guilt's taken away because your sin is atoned for. And when that sears you, like, you know you've encountered God. We're in the great state of Texas. I, I was floored when I moved here. Can we just hear from the people not from Texas just one time? Can we just hear from the people not from Texas? Thank you. Georgia. 
so when I was, uh, when I graduated from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, I came to uh, grad school in Fort Worth, Texas, and um, I, I'll spare you all the details, but wow, that's all I can tell you. I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. A, we have four seasons in Atlanta for you Texas people. I'll try to work this out really quickly for you, but there, there actually is more than just summer and some sort of winter and then summer and winter. Like, there is no fall in Texas. We, I lived in Waco, Texas for about 10 years, my wife and I did. And um, in Waco, Texas, they, they do not have fall. They have fell. <laughs> Can anybody back me up on that, that this, in Waco, Texas? We, we went, my wife and I one night went to a movie in Waco, Texas. This is a true story. She will back me up on this. When we went in the theater, we were out on Valley Mills. It's a theater, I don't think it's there anymore. And we, we go in this theater, it's 75 degrees. We are wearing shorts, flip-flops, T-shirt, it's Waco, it's 75. We watch a movie that lasts less than two hours. We come out, it is 45 degrees. That's a true story. And the wind is blowing 190 miles an hour straight from Alberta to Waco. And all the leaves on the eight trees that we had in Waco all died and fell off that night, and it was fell. That was a shocker for me, because we have a glorious spring in Atlanta, Georgia. We have a wonderful fall, we have a nice winter, we have a nice summer, it's amazing. And we have hills, another crazy concept. Um, so you have the hill country, we actually just have hills, you know, it's pretty amazing. You don't have to drive somewhere to see them, you just, they're there, you know? <laughs> when I got to Fort Worth, Texas, I lived on the west side of Fort Worth, Texas when I went to grad school. Yeah, kind of on the, over on the TCU side of town. And um, I, I'll just try to get them all in there. I've, I've been around Texas a lot. Um, you, you could see Nevada from my apartment. I mean, I was just like, Are you, this is crazy, it's crazy. It was, a, it was a shocker to me. And I have no idea why I even started talking about Texas now, but it was a nice little moment that we all had together. Anybody know where I left off going to Texas? I don't. So when I got to Texas, um, I, this was a shocker. People wore cowboy boots, I, I did not know. I mean, now I know ladies wear them, but um, nobody was wearing cowboy boots in Atlanta, trust me. I did not know what Wranglers were, or Ropers. I didn't even, I thought that was like, like on TV kind of stuff, I didn't know. And I got to Fort Worth and I was like, wow, this is crazy. And then I fell in love with this girl from Houston, Texas, this Baylor student. And they have a, a ranch slash farm about an hour and a half from here where they had cows. And so we went to the farm to work the cows from Atlanta, Georgia. I won't even tell you some of the things you do when you work a cow, because, wow. But I got in touch with this, the reality of cows. Most of our cows have tags in their ears. But a few of them, we'd get some mixed in that actually had been branded. And I, again, I was like, I didn't really know that happened. I didn't know that was like for real. Anybody living in Texas, part of Texas, where you like Brandon cattle, where you live? Anybody know what I'm talking about? A few people who are still doing that. And so what happens is, is that the, the, the people, bless their hearts, want to know that if the cow gets out, people will know where to bring it back. And so they put a big old hot iron in a fire and they stick it on the side of the cow. This cow's already been shot in the ear with pellets. It's gotten a couple of very large injections. If it's possibly having a baby, it's had a checkup, which wasn't all that exciting, um, or maybe was exciting, I don't know. Um, if it's a little boy coming up, not such a great afternoon, and a whole lot of stuff has gone down, and then at the end of the day, there's like tss. But apparently cows are not super smart, have thick skin, their hide is thick and then they don't remember stuff very long because after a while they're just off in the pasture with this brand on the side of them, which seems very inhumane, but it is Texas after all. (laughs) 
Texas is a country unto itself. It abides by no law but the law of Texas. And, and that's what we're talking about. That's, that's the kind of encounter and the kind of gospel we're talking about. It's not a kind of grace that you just sort of ride by and sort of grab some off the, you know, the cafeteria line. Oh, that looks good, yep, oh, no, nah. yep, yep, oh, don't do that, no, thank you, no, thank you, oh, yes, two of those, thank you, no, thank you, no, thank you, oh, uh-huh, uh, thank you, thank, no, thank you, no, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's, that, that's not grace, and that's not the gospel. The gospel isn't, I like being forgiven, I'm not all that right now into being holy, Oh, I love the kindness of God, but man, I, I don't really want any, any suffering in my life or any hardship in my life. Thank you very much, Jesus. You did a good job on that, though. Way to go. Um, I just want a lot of ease, if possible. Um, that's not the gospel. The gospel is I'm in trouble, and Jesus arrives on the scene, and a cross gets, like, seared into me. It, I'm marked by God and for God. I'm his. So that if for some chance I ever did get foolish and wander off somewhere else, at least somebody would be able to say, aren't, aren't you one of his? See, that's, that's what Judah was saying this afternoon, and that's the way we talk to each other. We don't beat each other over the head, we just say, hey man, um, I think you're in the wrong pasture. Because haven't you been marked with grace? H haven't you been marked and seared with the mercy of God? And then that third piece is that we're sent. Conveniently, three S's. And, and I just feel like maybe where we're ending tonight is that if, if there's not three pieces in the equation the, the equation is, is faulty somehow. So we're stunned by God. The, 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 there is a moment where we're like, okay, I, I, I just need to stop right in my tracks. We're, we're seared by the grace of God and the mercy of God. And then we're sent by God. The, the way I would say it is if we were crushed by grace, we get sent by mercy, and it always happens that way. We, we don't just get crushed by grace and then stay in that grace state. We get crushed by grace and instantly find ourselves being catapulted forward with the story of Jesus in our lives. And so if what is happening in this place is stunning and what is happening in this place is searing, then what's happening in the Toyota Center tonight is there's gonna be a lot of sending happen out of the Toyota Center tonight. There are gonna be people who are motivated like never before to go back to their city, back to their campus, back to their friends, back to their work, back to wherever it is they came from, and they're gonna be lit up with a passion to tell people about Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done, and how he's worked into their lives. That is the outcome of an encounter with God. Is that we're sent. And, and, and in my life, I, you know, I, I just know how challenging this is for me. And, and what a difficult thing it is for all of us to have been born in America, the greatest nation on earth for my money. But such a challenging place to become a follower of Jesus because in America it's perfectly acceptable to be minimally stunned, majorly seared, supposedly, and hardly ever sent. Perfectly normal. American follower of Jesus. Come into worship, go out of worship. Oh, but love the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Sent? Ah, not feeling it. More focused on what I need to do for me. And I, I love the people who've come and led here because I, I, they're, they're heroes to me. Such great partners, but friends, we've been in this a long time. 
someone like Beth Moore. I, I just ask you, do you think Beth Moore has encountered God? What do you think? No, seriously, what do you think? You think yes. Why? Because she comes up here like she's lit on fire. And she pours her life out for other people to know the power of Jesus. And there are hundreds of millions of people and countless women around this world who she gets on her knees for and sheds tears for and digs into this word for and pours her life out for. And we love it but she got it, stunned, seared, sent. You think Francis Chan has ever encountered God? Man, man can't even talk without just being broken up. And, and what has he done? I, all I've known about Francis Chan since I met him was going to Africa, taking the proceeds from his books and he's funding ministries all around the world. He's going and serving people in the streets of San Francisco. He's going and speaking to people everywhere he can and he's pouring his life out. The man is sent by the mercy of God. And if we ever think we, we're gonna get the encounter and then sort of pause in the middle, it's not gonna be real. Because the real thing sends us out, and it sends us out different people. I, I've, I've been reading, uh, I love uh, space, astronomy. Um, we, we have an astronaut with us, one of our friends Shane Kimbrough's here, he's been to the International Space Station, he's over there, that's pretty crazy. Um, he was the one that helped facilitate getting our other astronaut friend to give us a welcome to Passion 2014 from the International Space Station, a video that was created just a few days ago, which is pretty amazing, and then beamed down to us and then put into the end of our deal, which is pretty, pretty awesome. But I, I, these, these guys are crazy. Guys like Shane who, who've been up in space and, and seen the Earth from space and been on, the, on board the station. But I was reading this book called um, Rocket Man about the early Apollo program, these first guys that that went to the moon. And it was talking about when they come back, and this is what, what really stunned me. It says, what were astronauts like when they first returned from outer space? And now he quotes Nurse D. O'Hare. They have something of a sort of a wild look, I would say, as if they'd fallen in love with a mystery up there. Shane probably knows what I'm talking about. We, we're just grasping, but he's probably like, I know what, I know what this means. Sort of it, as if they haven't got their feet back on the ground, as if they regret having come back to us. A rage at having come back to earth. As if up there, they're not only freed from weight, from the force of gravity, but from desires, affections, passions, ambitions from the body. She goes on, did you know that for months, John Glenn, and Wally Shearer and Scott Carpenter went around looking at the sky. So they, they've been in orbit, but now they're back on Earth. And she said for months they just walked around looking up in the sky. Something had grabbed their hearts about space. So for months they'd walked around looking at the sky. You could speak to them and they didn't answer. You could touch them on the shoulder and they didn't notice. Their only contact with the world was a dazed, absent, happy smile. They smiled at everything and everybody. And they were always tripping over things. They kept tripping over things because they never had their eyes on the ground. When I read that, I, I thought encounter. I thought seeing. I thought eyes open. I thought this must be what it's like 
to taste and see that the Lord is good. This must be what it's like to close the door of your closet and get on your knees with God and have such an encounter with God right there in the dark, in a small space, just you and God. No arena, no people, no music, no band, just you and God where your eyes are open in such a way that when you walk out of the door of the closet, you're like, flip, I have been with the creator of the universe in a real small space and that's pretty stunning right there. And they walk out the door and there's something about them. It's like, yes, I am on earth. I'm walking on earth, but there's something about them that you know when you're around them. It's not all about here and now. Something has fired them up about the greater story of God. And they're always kind of looking up. Not that crazy, like I can't be of use to anybody because we're in the world, but not of the world. Uh, We're on mission on planet earth. We have to be able to speak two languages, the kingdom and the world. We got to translate the gospel for people who can't speak the kingdom yet. We've got to be in the world, but not of the world. But walking in the world, a lot of times we're just kind of bumping along like, yeah, I'm with you, man. I'm listening to you right now. I'm a part of what's going on right now. But in my mind, I'm thinking about something so far more glorious than anything here. I love earth, I love earth, I love things about it. I love, I love earth, I enjoy earth. God made this place and I, and I love what he's made, but I, I don't wanna get so absorbed in it. I wanna have that kind of stunning encounter, that kind of searing encounter, that kind of sending encounter that I can actually walk out into the world and I have something to offer people. I have something to say and something to share and something to give. Colossians 3. Verse one, this is the way Paul wrote it. He said, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. You see, at the middle of our story is not just a cross, but at the middle of our story is a resurrection. We wear the cross around our neck because it looks better than wearing a little empty tomb around your neck on a necklace. But it's one story. Christ was crucified for the sins of the world, for our sins. He was dead and buried in our tomb, but he also was raised from the dead by the power of God so that he could stand as the first one triumphant over death, hell, sin, and the grave. And this is our story. Our story isn't just locked in to what Jesus did on the cross. Our story is really rooted in the fact that Jesus is alive from the dead. And so what does that mean to us today? It means our story is a story of resurrection. So whatever it is you're hoping for and whatever it is I'm praying for, can I just share with you, it's possible, because your condition isn't worse than Jesus' condition when he was dead and buried in a borrowed tomb. He was in bad shape, but that wasn't too bad a shape because God, by his power, raised him up from the dead. So whatever it is you're praying for, whatever it is you're hoping for, it's possible because our story is a story of resurrection life, and God can bring anything back to the lot to life and that's what he's saying here he says yes you were down but you've been raised since then you have been raised with Christ so when he died you died when he was raised you were raised that's our position so he said that's true then set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God set your minds on things above not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So, so the journey is from death to life, to his life in us, to being with him in glory. Stunned, seared, sent on mission crushed by grace, sent by mercy. Do do you know that the beautiful thing about mercy is, is that it's mercy. It's hard to sell to us because we're, we're extraordinarily entitled people. But the only thing you and I were entitled to was death. And we were entitled to that. And everything we got but death is called mercy. And when we truly receive it, it moves us to the world. 
So that's what Isaiah found. Look at the end of this in verse, in chapter six in verse eight. So he's been stunned and he's been seared. And immediately this is what happened. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. So the only thing he's heard so far is a seraph saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Another seraph saying, this coal has touched your lips, your, your guilt's taken away, your sin's atoned for. That's all he's heard so far, but now he hears the voice of the Lord. So notice, the Lord didn't say, your guilt's taken away and your sin is atoned for. He sent a messenger to say that. And the Lord didn't say, I am holy, holy, holy. He let the angels say that. But when the Lord spoke, notice what he spoke. And then I heard, after these tongs came, so it wasn't like a big progression of, I'm stunned, and that was like 10 years, and then I got grace, and that was a long period, and then God spoke to me, just bam, saw the Lord. Bam, mercy of God in my life. And then right on the back side of that, he said, and then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I love that, because it's a little Trinitarian uh, uh, curveball right there. Who, who shall I send and who will go for us? Who's the us? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so immediately the mission is in play. We got a guy who's finished, a guy who gets mercy, and now we get the mission. And God says, uh, as, as if God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are in the presence of Isaiah, who's just been touched by, uh, crushed by grace and, and just b- been brought to life by the mercy of God. It says if they're talking in earshot of Isaiah and they're talking sort of rhetorically to each other, well, who shall we sin? Who do you think we should send? Who do you think we should send? We wanna redeem the whole world. We want the whole world to come to know salvation. That's the meaning of Isaiah. Yahweh is salvation. We want all of TCU to hear the gospel. We don't want a little band of people to be alive. We want every single student on the campus to hear the name of Jesus. We want everybody at Sam Houston State to hear the name of Jesus. Texas State University, we want them all to hear the name of Jesus. Texas Tech University, University of Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Rice, you name them all. We want them all to hear the story of Jesus. So they're talking, who shall we send? I don't know, who's gonna go for us? Who should we send? Well, who do you think we should send? Who do you think we should send? We want salvation to come to the nations. We want all people to hear the gospel. Who do you think we should send? Who do you think we should send? I don't know, who are we gonna send? And our message of salvation, and Isaiah's standing over here, been seared by a coal from the altar of God. He was done, now he is undone, done, and he's whole again, and he's alive again, and he hears the conversation and they're talking. And he's like, hey, over here, over here. Hey, me, me, I hear you, I hear you. Hey, he said, who shall we send? Who will go for us? And he said, here I am, send me. Five minutes ago, he was done. And now he's volunteering to be the messenger of God. Just like four sentences ago, toast and now he's shot his hand up in the air and he's saying here am I send me why me? Why, why is he so eager? Why is he such a good choice? Why is it that in, in, your, in your searching that you should land on me? Here's why, because I know what this is all about because I have 
been stunned by God and I have been seared by his grace and mercy. And I'm telling you what, I have got a message to tell the people. I've got something to say to people. I can tell people, I know what it's like to be apart from God. I know what it's like to be without God. And I know what it's like to be touched by the mercy and the grace of God. I get it. I understand it. I know what it's like to be separated and I know what it's like to be brought to life. Send me, I'm, I'm your guy. Not because I'm holier than thou or I'm high and mighty or I've got some great you know, me story to tell. My story is just, hey, I don't know, if you're struggling, I know what that's like. Can I tell you something? When Jesus comes into your world, it absolutely will rock you to the core. He did that in my life. He did that in my life. I love it because at the end of the day, there wasn't any conscription going on to get people into the mission. It was total volunteerism. There was no, all right, Isaiah, the coal thing, you owe us. And here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna go to these people. Now, they're gonna be stiff-necked and rebellious and hard-hearted. It's not gonna be fun, but you're gonna go. You're gonna be our messenger of salvation to them, and you're gonna do it for your whole lifetime. That's, that's what you're gonna do. There wasn't any forced labor. God isn't a human trafficker. Everybody that's in the mission, that needs to be in the mission, said yes. Because there is no stunning and searing that doesn't result in sending. The gospel never stops with me. Not the gospel. There is a gospel that stops with me, but the gospel never stops with me. And that's what God is about in this place. And he's not gonna start backwards. So he's not gonna come in to Toyota Center and say, okay, I'm gonna send some people. So we're gonna talk about sending for 30 hours. But I wanna show you something in a minute because we're gonna give people an opportunity in just a couple of minutes here to stand and say, God is sending me to the nations. And we haven't even done a missions talk here. But when people are stunned and seared, guess what, they get sent. And some of you are like, this is crazy because this isn't even like a missions thing and I'm like feeling like God wants me to say yes to his plan to take the gospel to all the people of the world. And I don't know how, when, or where it's gonna work out, but I know I'm gonna spend most of my life living outside of the United States of America. And it's not because I have to, it's because I choose to. When I heard him saying, who am I gonna send and who will go for us? I said, I'm telling you who's, who you're gonna send and I'm telling you who's gonna go for you. Somebody like me who had no chance without Jesus, but who got Jesus, who knew my guilt is done away with and my sin is atoned for and I am alive and I am on fire and I got a story to tell and I got a message for the world World, and I am the person you're gonna send and I'm the person that's gonna go for you. The answer is yes. And you can fill in all the details later. You can tell me when, how long, where, at what cost. You can tell me all of that later. I'm telling you yes before I even know what the questions are and even before I know what the assignment is, I already have seen enough and experienced enough to say send me, here am I, send me. And we're gonna give you a chance to stand in this building and say you're talking about me and you're gonna see, we're gonna see the power of the gospel. Because people in every section of this building are gonna stand. And we're gonna go, man, that's crazy. We didn't even like build up to that. That's because people saw and people got seared. And when they did, their hearts started running after the things of God. You don't start backwards and say, we gotta get some people sent. I mean, it is true that 90% of the university students and university age young people represented in the 42 states in this building are going to sleep again tonight without a fat clue of why they're on planet earth. So there is a need, but we don't start with the sending. 
We don't even start with the searing. So it's not just Jesus, cross, gospel, Jesus, grace, mercy. We start with the, the seeing, the stunning. Because the stunning brings us to the searing and the searing fuels us for the sending. And I want us to be that generation. I want us to be the generation that says, here am I, send me. I got enough heaven that I can be of use to you on earth. I won't trip the whole time, but I will trip every now and then. <laughs> I will be able to focus on the need and get in with the plan, but I, I'm gonna be looking up in the sky a little bit too, because I, I, my heart is already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. I, I died and I'm hidden with Christ in God, and that's who I am, and when he comes in his glory, I'm gonna be coming with him in his glory. That's a reality for me. The clock's counting down or counting up right now. I'm headed into that reality, and I know it, and, but, but I can still be useful to you here, even though my heart is already there. And that's the power of seeing Jesus. Lord, thank you. Always works this way. John in Revelation saw you, hair like white like wool, eyes like fire, flaming sword coming out of your mouth, face like the sun, fell down dead, but you touched him and you raised him up and then you said, write all this down and you sent him to us with a vision and a message. Lord, thank you that you've opened eyes in this place, truly opened our spiritual eyes to see. And thank you that you've seared the, the work of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus into our hearts in this place. There are people here that were marked here that will forever be marked by you, for you and by you in this place. But I also thank you that you're stirring our hearts right now, that this is just the beginning of the end.